Imagine a world with no cold calling. A world where companies don't sell your data to other companies who want to pester you. At G4 Claims, we don't cold call and we don't buy a single lead from data companies. Oh, and if you're due any compensation from your car accident, you pay nothing to us at all. For full accident management support, including motor replacement, repairs and personal injury compensation claims, just search G4 Claims today for help the way you want it. Uh, hi and welcome to this week's episode of DW Podcast. I am joined by Ewan Gibbs, uh, a lecturer in history at Glasgow Uni uh, and author of Coal Country, The Meaning and Memory of Deindustrialisation in Post-War Scotland. Ewan, thanks so much for, for coming on. How are you doing? I'm good today. How are you? I Not bad at all. Not bad. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure to have you on and, and I think, you know, for those that don't know you, maybe just a, a wee bit of an introduction about yourself. I kind of says, you know, that you're a, a lecturer on history at Glasgow, but I mean, some of the studies that you've been doing, particularly around uh, Scotland and over the years, fascinate me and I'm sure they'll, they'll fascinate many people listening. So I give us a wee bit of information about your, yourself and how you got to where you are. Certainly. Um, I started at Glasgow University, actually, as, as an undergraduate student in 2008. Um, I, I studied economic and social history. Uh, the week I, the week of my freshers' week was the week that RBS collapsed, and you know we had a, we had the beginning of a, another uh, major crisis of the world economy. So that was part of the background, and, and frankly, the other background was I was a, an active socialist at that time. I'd been involved in protests against the Iraq War, and you know broadly o- o- oppositional to. The worst excesses in new labour. Um, so I suppose that was what drew me to studying economic and social history. And while I was there, I became especially interested in the history of the labour movement and working class history. And I actually wrote my undergraduate dissertation on the anti poll tax movement. So that was on, you know, an important episode in, in opposition to Thatcherism that was framed as opposition to a, an attack on the working class, especially the unemployed and, and the poor, poorly paid people. But it was it was also framed in Scottish national terms. So it was opposition to a policy that was tested a year early in Scotland by a government that was widely understood to have no mandate in Scotland by that point in time. So that's where my sort of background comes from in terms of why do I do the sort of research that I do. But one of the animating features of, of the poll tax campaign was actually deindustrialization. So if you look at the people who were worst affected by the poll tax, which was a tax per head that replaced a property rates, which had been the previous way that local taxation was, was done, that meant that unemployed people were paying it, families were paying it, the poorly paid were paying it. So this was an attack which affected people who maybe had already lost jobs in coal mines or steelworks or factories or shipyards, or who were especially young, young men who were the group most affected by unemployment at the time, who were unable to take up the sorts of jobs that perhaps their fathers and grandfathers had. So the other thing about the full tax movement is it was a non-payment campaign. It was a community campaign. It was supported often by socialist and trade unionists, but it didn't have a workplace presence. And that's very different to earlier campaigns that I'd read and studied in Scottish history. You know, I, I you'd expect to find an industrial working class presence in those sorts of campaigns in the, the 1960s or 70s or 80s, perhaps. But by the late 80s and early 90s, that changed. So that was where my interest in deindustrialization came from. And I, I went on to write a, a PhD that studied deindustrialization in your neck of the woods in, in Lanarkshire. And I was specifically interested in the coal miners, partly because the coal mining industry was the largest uh, industrial sector historically, and because it was centrally important to communities that were built around it, and because of the political role of coal miners in the in the Scottish labour movement and radical politics. And what I found in that PhD is that deindustrialization was actually a lot longer process than we maybe think about. So, you know, in Lanarkshire, it will be the demolition of Ravenscraig, which some of your listeners might be able to remember and others might have heard about. It's maybe those 
big final closures of the 80s and 90s that we think about. But what I would say is that actually deindustrialization starts in the 1940s for me. And it, it starts in the area around shops where you have systematic divestment of local collieries. The expectation that, that miners would relocate their families to other parts of Scotland to maintain employment in the industry. So I, that's where I came from, and that's that's the research that, that I developed. Um, through that process of studying the industrialization, I also started to get at that kind of overlap between class and nationhood in Scottish politics. And I found that deindustrialization was managed under a nationalized coal industry in my context, which was obviously centrally ultimately administered from London, although I had in the 40s and 50s quite significantly devolved elements. So some Scottish decisions were made in Scotland, for lack of a better expression. Over time, it became increasingly centralized and protests against the industrialization over the 60s and into the 70s were often voiced in national as well as class terms that became connected to demands for Scottish devolution. So there was an industrial or economic element to that call for political democracy and identified the Communist Party activists who often played a leading role in the miners union and our industrial unions were, were quite important to that story. Um, Sorry if this is a somewhat long-winded answer to your, your question, but since then I've I've continued that research and that informs the book, but I've, I've also been involved in industrial heritage activities um, and some of those again relate to Lanarkshire, especially the Caterpillar Tractor Factory occupation of 1987, which took place in Tannock Side. That was one of those big final protests against the industrialization that I mentioned. That was a protest against the closure of a large American factory which had been built on top of a mining village in the 1950s. So you, you get waves of industrial change here. And the factory was occupied by its, its workforce for three months, over, for over 100 days in an attempt to oppose closure. Um, what I became involved with was in 2017, the 30th anniversary, the Caterpillar Workers Legacy Group put exhibitions on, they made a film, they took part, there was a commemorative debate at the Scottish Parliament that they attended, they put on a reunion event. I, I got involved in that, I recorded some oral histories and, and helped do some archival research in tandem with them. Since then, I was also involved in a school project which used some of this work, we took some of the the, the former shop stewards and activists in the classrooms and they were the, the star of the show. But it was a an interesting episode in, in what you were saying earlier, that perhaps working class history doesn't always enjoy the place in the, the curriculum that it should or doesn't have the same presence that it ought to. And, you know, I think that was a useful exercise in, in thinking about how we can bring that into into places where it's especially relevant, where it's part of the part of the furniture and on its doorstep. Absolutely, and that's not not at all a windy answer at all. I thought that was fantastic, and, and one of the reasons you know for for me wanting to chat to you on here is obviously as you mentioned, I'm from Lanarkshire, and and many of the listeners will be from you know west or central Scotland. The industrialisation has played a, a massive part in in my life and my family's life, and of that of many families across that community. But I think for people of our generation or, or from our age, we often don't really know the background of that, and I think you've touched on some really important memories and, and times in history there for example the, the caterpillar occupation you know in terms of the ravens Creek getting torn down and and people of my age i would think that's when they really think about the industrialization but it's really interesting for you to say you know i actually think it started happening in the 40s yeah no i i think that's right i think we think about those big final moments and that that's understandable because firstly it produced the pop song <coughs> produced the proclaimers singing about it even Runrig wrote a song about Raven's Craig, which isn't quite as good. But, um, so. you know, and, I, and it produced the, the emblematic images. Like I think particularly that picture of the demolition of the Raven's Craig Towers, but also the widespread memories of the 1984-5 minor strike, which Raven's Craig also figured in, are, are important. And also it, it was that period which had the worst impact in terms of mass unemployment. And, you know, it might be that your listeners or, or their family members were affected by that sort of displacement. I'd say older men were retired early, often quite and quite cruelly in some ways. You know, they might have been provided with the economic means to survive at a slightly lower level, but they weren't given 
the same sense of social purpose that industrial employment had provided. Younger men faced a different set of problems. They were having to adjust to, to labour markets, which were very unexpected. And women were also adversely affected. And it's important we remember that, that, you know, some of these large factories, Caterpillar wasn't one of them, but there were other large factories like the Burris factory in Cumberland that produced the electronics. They were, they, they had large female workforces and female rates of unemployment weren't nearly as bad, but transitioning out of a well-paid unionised job, potentially in, a, in the context of being part of a married couple where your husband might also be in another one, to a situation where you perhaps become the sole wage earner in a, in a much less well-paid and secure services job is also part of that story. So that's why we think about the earlier period. But why, why would I say it's about a period, it's about something that happens basically after the Second World War. Um, as you probably know, the 1920s and 1930s weren't an easy time in Scotland, always was being very heavily reliant on heavy industry. So rates of unemployment in some parts of, of Lanarkshire and elsewhere in Clydeside would have been over 50% for men. Um, you know, coal mines and steelworks were, were shuttled. And that that had an effect on policy making. And there, there was a consensus among trade union leaders as well as industrial administrators, civil servants and, and politicians of both conservative and labour stripes that you know, that couldn't happen again. And one, one way of, of avoiding that would be investing in new industries. So Lanarkshire was, was too reliant on coal mining and steel making. And its coal mines were seen as old, low quality, and they weren't great places to work. Like you're talking about men, you know, working at coal faces with, 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 with seams that were only two or three foot hand stripping faces with pickaxes up to their necks in water or certainly lying on, on wet surfaces all day. Um, so there's a logic to this. And so you concentrate coal mining in productive large collieries. And that included some collieries in Lanarkshire. So Cardowan would be an example of that. Um, but mostly they were to be concentrated elsewhere in Scotland. Like in, in Fife, the, the seams were six foot high. The coal was a lot easier to get out of the ground. So you, you'd move miners to there. The people that stayed would maybe partly take up jobs in new industries. So that's where Caterpillar comes from. That's where Burroughs comes from. These would be new industries that would provide employment for women as well as men. Um, as well. So there's a social balancing going on here. So part of my argument in the book is that, look, deindustrialization isn't always terrible. Right? You can you can arrange and organize these things in different ways. Um, and I think that's important. When we think about Britain or, or Scotland, it's not exceptional if we look at other European economies to have had a far more industrial economy 50 or 60 years ago than we have now. But I think we can say that it was particularly poorly managed in the 80s and 90s. Um, but nevertheless, those earlier experiences weren't painless. That, you know, certainly the area around shots, the, the minutes I've got from the closure records of collieries, meetings with trade unions in the nationalised industry, demonstrate a lot of growing unease, an unease in the local community as well. You know, Coal mines were, were central to the reason that shots in the surrounding communities existed. They'd grown in the 19th century through that, that experience. And so what you see is what I call the moral economy in action. So closure, the closure of communities had to be agreed with trade union representatives. Workers needed to be provided with appropriate alternative employment for themselves, but also the community needed to be provided with an alternative basis for economic survival. And in shorts, that involves the opening of a Cummins, Cummins is engineering factory, for instance. So we have, we have a relatively pragmatic, socially conscious form of managing these processes, I'd say, between the 40s and the 70s. And that's the big, big difference from the 80s and 90s. I think it's it's really important to touch on what you mentioned there was the working conditions. You know, I think 
we often hear these utopian views of what it was like to work in the coal mines back in the day or what it was like to work in Ravenscraig or, or the steelworks or any heavy industry across Scotland. You know, you, you very rarely hear the, the hardships that these workers had to go through. It's all the romantic stories and, you know, we, we wish they were back. But you, you made a really good point. You know, the conditions there were extremely poor in many cases. Yeah, I mean, what I'd say is that the National Union of Mine Workers was actually quite happy, certainly in the 40s and 50s, to close down, you know, poor, unproductive, terrible you know, collieries into, that had terrible working conditions in return for better fits with, that were cleaner and were viewed to be safer and more productive and so able to pay higher wages. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, working conditions in coal mines were never easy, right? It's not as if the ones that, that were built that were modern were also easy places to work. They were loud. They were disproportionately dangerous. They were dark. Um, the steel industry was very, very hot in a lot of places. And, you know, these things had long-term effects on people. Firstly, you have you know, a high rate of industrial accidents. It wasn't uncommon for people to lose hands and fingers or to be hit by falling rocks and coal mines, for instance. That would have been true in our industrial sectors. Fatalities were not that rare, you were. Um, but what I would say is the industry becomes a lot safer. Like, nationalisation is a good thing for miners. And I, I didn't interview a single miner or a member of a mining family who would have disagreed. They had criticisms of the nationalised industry, but it was universally agreed in, in the oral histories I collected from my book that, you know, this was a massive change and it was a change for the better. Um, partly because trade unions were became much more involved in the day-to-day -day running of pits, but partly because of the the forms of investment and the, the changes in the industry that we're talking about, partly because of the closure of those those older units where working conditions were, were especially poor. So mining was always comparatively dangerous in Britain, but it was a lot less comparatively dangerous by the 1970s. Um, there were, though, I would also say in that important caveat to that general point, the new large collieries were also dangerous in alloys because they had they were hi highly mechanised. They were reliant on machines and electrical equipment. Um, so, although the, the industry was becoming safer, there were a series of major accidents in Scottish collieries from the sort of the mid fifties to to the early seventies. Um, one of those was the Auchin Geek colliery disaster, which you may have heard of. That was the that was the worst disaster that, that affected the, the Scottish coal weather industry in the nationalised era. And 47 men died uh, following an underground fire at, at a North Lanarkshire pit. And I've actually, I've attended the uh, annual commemoration for that. It was organised by a, a man who's now a councillor in North Lanarkshire, Willie Doolan, who's a, a former miner. Uh, his, his father worked at the Auchin Geek Colliery. And, in my book, I'd, I argue that, you know, these sorts of commemorations are an important part of, of ongoing connections to the industrial past. So it's not only that deindustrialization doesn't just happen in the 80s and 90s, it's also that it's not a clean break. Like, we're still growing up, you know, we've matured in a Scotland which is still in some ways affected by elements of that industrial experience and by people that still certainly remember it. Absolutely, and I, and I think you touched on it earlier as well when you says, you know, that the, the knock-on effect is, is still visible in these communities and as much as it may have been a long term ago, when these people are, when they're shutting down these industries, they're looking at alternative jobs for people out there and, and there's many men and women across the community and across Scotland that I believe never found anything else and, you know, you're, you're going from a, an industry, certainly if I take Ravenscraig, for example, where people are very proud to work there. You know, they're creating steel that's going all across the world. You know, it's it's putting some of the most popular, most famous buildings, you know, in, in the whole of the world, you know, that's got the, the Ravenscraig print on it. And then to take them away from that and think, you know, that there's nothing here for them, it, it dents your pride as well, doesn't it? Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. I mean, that idea of moral economy, I think, certainly relates to that sense of having a, a stake in a, a physical, visible industrial infrastructure, which also has a, a national recognition and status. And, you know, I think something that, that really is quite 
remarkable about Britain or, or exact that's exceptional about the, the period from the 40s to the 70s is actually the legitimate status that industrial workers and their organisations enjoy in Britain and that you know, comes to an end in, in the 80s and 90s and was a, wasn't the case before that period as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it, the long-term outcomes are still with us. If we look at deindustrialization, it, it it's associated in the British context, especially with a marked rise in inequalities. Um, Britain becomes a much more unequal economy and, and labour market. And that that's still with us. Um, and I think the the people who suffer most from that are manual workers and those who who, who lack university qualifications. What well, one of the impacts of this, if we look at it on a kind of labour market level, is what we might call the creation of an hourglass labour market. So, what the industrial economy certainly is, it was managed in that post-war period, especially provided was actually a, a wrong quite a sizable wrong of what we might refer to now as middle income jobs. So stable, well-paid working class jobs. And part of the effects of deindustrialization and the recreate the, the, the remolding of the labor market in a very politicized manner has been the elimination of those sorts of jobs. And and I think that, you know, that harks back to when you were younger, you know, it was often if your dad worked in a certain industry, he'd get you a job there. You know, if your granddad worked there, he probably got your dad there. You know, and, and that has totally disappeared now. I understand why, but, you know, it's these jobs were often jobs for life. And that's something that, as you touch on an unstable, you know, working market, labour market at the moment, it doesn't really exist anymore. Yeah, I mean, that that's an interesting... I think there's been some interesting things to unpick there. I think, I think you're right that familial links to industry, you know... Most of the miners I interviewed, their fathers and a lot of cases, their grandfathers and brothers and other other male members of the family had also worked there. And that was true of the steelworks. It was true of, of skilled trades and shipyards as well. Um, and there was some quite interesting interviews from the Caterpillar factory. I, I interviewed at least one man who, who was a second generation shop steward at Caterpillar is... His father had been a shop steward. His grandfather had been a trade union activist in the mining industry. And he, there were all our family members involved. And, and I think the other thing is that these workplaces were often quite familial environments. Yeah. Uh, people would enter them at a relatively young age. Their social lives were often quite heavily integrated to the workplace. Workplaces, you know, in the in the coal industry, workplaces sometimes had football teams and took part in leagues and competitions against one another. A low caterpillar were a private enterprise. They were actually quite paternalistic in some ways, and they sponsored family days and events. And you know, it meant that these workplaces had a had a role when often in Lanarkshire, relatively small scale communities as well. So that that that's something that I think is quite important to think about. I don't think that work leisure and social lives necessarily have the the same level of integration that they, they did then. Um, I suppose there's a couple of qualifiers that I might put on that on what we're saying though. And, and one of them is that obviously lots of collieries shut in the time that I'm looking at. But at the same time, that didn't stop miners from having lifetime careers in the coal industry. And this is partly about the organization of the industrialization in the nationalized industry that actually where you organize broadly on moral economy principles, you can easily provide people with a lifetime career, which is relatively stable, even if you go through several collieries. And another element of, of that is career progression as well, that actually certainly some of the men I spoke to would have gone into coal mining age 15 or 16 without any qual formal qualifications. But, you know, through the, the coal board's infrastructure of night schools and education, they could climb the ranks to, you know, relatively high, relatively high, high standing in terms of becoming colliery officials and overmen. Um, and some of them voluntarily left the coal industry to pursue more lucrative careers elsewhere as well. Of course, and in, in your book, you and you know, the, the, the title of it is, is the meaning and memory of deindustrialization and post 
World Scotland. Talking about the memory, I, I could listen to you all day. I find it fascinating, you know, and, and I think that I'm, I'm very proud of the area that I'm from as well. But I feel, and I've touched on this before we started recording, that I'll be perfectly honest and hold my hands up and say, I probably don't know as much as I should. And at that, I probably know more than many because I've taken the time to read into it. And it's something for me that, not just in, you know, deindustrialization, but I feel Scottish history as a whole, you know, there's so many stories to tell there, but we're not told them as a young age. You know, I, I, I've harped back to this in a few podcasts, and I believe that, you know, when I was at high school, in history, they were teaching you about the Titanic, you know, or they, or they were showing you Braveheart. And I just feel, you know, in, in terms of the curriculum, there's there's so many things there that I feel would engage, you know, younger generations more to learn about where they've came from. As a teacher of sorts, I'm obliged to defend the profession in the sense that I do think that it's worth remembering that we only do history at school until we're 14, you know, on a mandatory basis and a lot of things are missed. But I, I take your point. I think that working class history deserves to be part of the the stories that we're told that I think often it's probably useful if it's somehow locally sourced working class history. Like it makes sense to do you know, I, I think I mentioned to you before that, that I did the, the project in all amateur secondary school where we we brought in shop stewards who'd been involved in the occupation. We looked at objects. We thought about the reuse of the factory site, which is now supermarkets and, and a housing scheme. And you know that that's quite emblematic of that bigger change in Scotland's economy. But I, I think using local examples and providing connections to, to to local experiences that might or might not have a family residence can be useful. One thing I would say is even when it doesn't have that family residence, I actually knowing that history and having a connection to it or a sense of connection to it can also give a sense of ownership of place in the past to people that might have moved in more recently. I mean, obviously one effect of the industrialization is that places like Mullerwell or Dunstan or, or, or uh, Middlesbrough become suburbs of Glasgow in a way that they weren't in the past. Like the people that live there leave it every day. So actually building some sort of sense of affinity and connection to place, I think, is one one use of that. I would say I think that in in, in North Lanarkshire the, the Summer Lee Museum is, is a brilliant resource, which, you know, has, has done some great stuff and the staff there, I know, are also interested in more recent episodes of industrial history like Caterpillar, but the the machines and the, the you know, the the physical artefacts that they've got there are really impressive. And I can imagine with infused young children in particular. I, I totally agree with you. Summerlee for me is, I don't think there's a, there's another museum like that in Scotland in terms of, you know, celebrating this industrial history that we've got. And uh, for, for a Motherwell fan's point of view as well, they'll get a wee bit in there about the time when we, we won the cup because it ties in with 91 and the, the shutting down of the, the steelworks and, and Thatcherism as well. But I don't know, maybe that was an unfair criticism, Ewan, but I just feel that when I when I think of history and, and the things that I studied, it's not as interesting as what I hope it was. And I feel that when you when you go on past the 14-year-old stage, it, it almost becomes more interesting. And I, and I wonder if we should be doing more to remember, you know, where we've came from and the, the people that have built these towns and cities before us. I don't necessarily put that down as well to the education system and schools. I don't necessarily think that has to be their place. And I think you've touched on it, you know, for example, when you said hey, you've been along to some memorial days for the miners. I think things like that are very, very important and there maybe should be more of them happening. Yeah, I think I think that's true. I think how we think about history with a capital H is it's important that we think about that in more radical and democratic terms. And we, we actually don't we don't separate personal or familial or local experiences from the nation the nation's history in that respect because actually ultimately the national historical story is only the agglomeration of all those a lot of stories and what we choose to prioritize is politically important and i think you know that recently we've, we've had a really good discussion i think we're starting a much better discussion about scotland's role in slavery and colonialism for instance and i think that's an important element of our history and and part of that then also has to lead into the history of industrial society and starting to to come into terms with what what the end of an industrial Scotland actually means, and that's that's part of of my work. And I think you're right. The stories of, for lack of a better expression, ordinary men and women who often did quite radical and extraordinary things, as well as you know kept the kept the wheels of the nation turning in that respect is. <laughs> 
is really important. I think that the memorial for Auchin Geek is one example of that. There are other there are other industrial memorials. Uh, there's one for the, the caterpillar occupation actually by the supermarket, which is, is quite good. Um there's been a lot there's been a big growth in memorials to mining disasters. That's been a noticeable trend. But I'd say there's been others. Um there's a group in Dundee that were associated with the Tynex factory, which was closed in the, the mid nineties, which like Caterpillar was another big American multinational, which provide and, and like Burroughs, it was one that provided a lot of work for women. But they've they've done some quite kind of fun stuff with murals. And I I think there's there's a range of, of ways of remembering that are maybe quite important as well. Like I think we, we should remember the mining disasters and all our fatalities and we should remember strikes and collective struggles for justice and rights in the workplace. We should probably also remember the everyday to some extent as well, though, which is perhaps less easy to capture. But the fact that these workplaces were there for a long period of time in the post-war period, they often provided people with good wages and a standard of living that their, their families hadn't enjoyed before. And perhaps it's important that we celebrate that as well. Do you feel that often history, and, and you mentioned there, you know, about uh, our colonial past and Scotland's history of the slave trade, do you think that history often isn't taught to an extent from a political perspective? I feel that, you know, often, certainly in Britain and Scotland would fall into this as well, as it almost feels like those before us don't want to talk about it because they're, they're ashamed of it in a certain way. You know, I, I mentioned the colonial past there. I mean, I suppose you could also... <laughs> We're ran by a Tory government at the moment, you know, at Westminster. Why would they want to teach you about the the trade union movement and and working class collectivism? Because it doesn't really fit their narrative. Yeah, I mean, I think actually we, you know, part of the one of the worst responses to the Black Lives Matter protest has been the assertion that you know BLM are politicising history, whereas we should understand that history is inherently political. It's it's not a question of well, our history is political, but well, we choose to recognise that and we recognise where we sit within the, the politics of history. I think that's a much more mature thing. I think that's hopefully what, what we're starting to do with with colonialism. I mean, that's a, an interesting point about the government we've got at the moment. Um, one maybe element of that that's directly related to my own research is the minor strike and the fact that this is not just history. Um, as you probably noticed recently, you know, the, there was significant movement now towards giving a pardon to minors in Scotland, including some of the people I interviewed, men I interviewed for my book, who had been arrested and, and convicted during the 1984-5 strike. So in that sense, history isn't just stuff that happened in the past. It's something that people are actually still living with. And there are still, you know, there were minors that were buried with, with unjust convictions and there are others that, are, that have carried them for well over 30 years. So I think that it becomes attached to a politics of, of recognition a politics of, and a politics of justice. And also implicitly then raises questions about how society should actually be ordered. But, you know, the, the struggle for the overturning of the wrongful convictions is a, an important struggle in its own right. It also raises much bigger questions about the type of society that Britain was in the 1980s, if the, the police could be used to prosecute those and the, the, the justice system could be used in a way that ended in those injustices. And, you know, have, how much has society actually changed in that respect since then is a, a question that we need to ask, I think. And it's a great question in itself, because I feel that from the outside looking in, you might think that Britain and, and the world as a whole or the Western world has came very far from, you know, the, the policing and the tactics of the 1980s. But if you look at the the scenes recently in America, you need to ask yourself, has it really? You know, you, you've got people there storming the Capitol building and it looks very much that when it's a Black Lives Matter prote protest, the, the police are extremely heavy handed. You know, people are getting attacked and, and lifted right, left and centre. And then when it's, you know, primarily, I, I don't know if this is fair to say, a, a whiter protest and it's, it's pro-Trump supporters, you know, they were basically opening the gates for people. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the Hillsborough Inquiry is quite an important gateway to, I think, the demand. And I hope that now that we've, they've had this success in Scotland, that 
the, there'll be an inquiry into the events at Orgreave Coken Works in, in June 1984. But actually, arguably, there should also be a larger inquiry into the policing of, of the rider strike. Um, Jim Phillips, a professor of economic and social history in Glasgow, who was my DhD supervisor, he played a leading, leading role in advising the the review in Scotland, but his work also suggests an element of political interference, which certainly in the minor strike and the policing of the strike, which does not match the the picture that was painted by government ministers at the time of neutrality and non-involvement in operational matters. Um, what I would also say is that research that I've, I've written up and hopefully will, will come out soon, this is really, it's in the book a bit, but there's a, it's, there's a longer piece of writing to be done on this, suggests that if we look at the operation of energy policy in post-war Britain, the decision to invest in oil burning and then nuclear power stations, that was driven by political hostility towards the power of unionised coal miners as well as economic considerations. and. The way that the coal board, which was supposed to be operationally independent, and that was an important you know, claim that Conservative ministers made, was managed after 1979, after the election of the Conservative government. It similarly involves a high degree of government interference, which is very unusual to what you'd, what you'd seen in the previous 32 years of its existence since 1947. So you have government direction on the closing of of collieries and the rate of the closing of collieries, for instance. They also draw coal board officials into actively planning an industrial dispute ahead of the 1983 general election. So there's there's elements of coordination and planning there which I think are, are important in relation to 84-5, but given what we now know about the 1980s as a whole, and perhaps also thinking about the legislative attacks on civil liberties in the 90s and 2000s and also, the severe restrictions that are now placed on trade union power in Britain, you know, it adds up to a much bigger set of questions about the role of the state and, and actually what, what, you know, what, what, what counts and what doesn't count as democracy. Perhaps also, I think one of the big questions in my research and what I try, you know, the courses I teach the students are, what is the place of the economy in a democratic society? You touched on the, you know, the the role of trade unions and, and the way that the trade unions, I suppose, have been been battered down uh, by all of this. And I look at my my peers and, and my colleagues and, and my friends, and I think often that we we don't realise, you know, that the importance that trade unions played back in the the seventies, eighties, even before that, and and now, to a certain extent, they don't exist for many young people. And and I, I, we can go, we could talk all day, you and about the the background and the, and the reasons for that, and you know certainly. Batchers attach attacks on the trade unions, but do you think we'll ever get back to the days of you know organised workforces in, in the level that we used to see? Well, what I would say is I don't think I think there's an easy version of that answer answer to that question, which would be, well, that was only possible because of the industrial working class, that like coal miners or, or steel workers or shipbuilders were kind of like because of their working conditions, their working processes. They lived in communities together, like they were almost preordained to be collectivist, and we don't have them anymore. So that's it. Uh, I don't agree with that, though. I actually think that if we look at the sectors that are you, there's two uh, two reasons I don't agree with that. The first of which would be that it took a very long time to build strong unions for coal miners in particular. Like it, you know, the 19th century, and even some of the first half of the 20th century, actually, it was littled with fragmented coal miners. Uh, it was littled with defeats of miners' unions. There was a, a really brave attempt to form a Lanarkshire miners' union in the middle of the 19th century that, that ultimately failed. And employers used all sorts of mechanisms, including uh, religious sectarianism, to, to divide workforces. The second reason is that, actually, if we look at where unions are strong now, that wasn't historically always the case. So actually, one of the effects of industrial workers being well unionised in the 60s and 70s is that other sectors get much stronger, service sectors. So now if we think about the typical union member, it's probably a woman who works in the public sector. Yeah. 
but they joined unions in the 70s, really, um, 70s and 80s. So, you know, teachers, civil servants, even specky university lecturers like <laughs> me are members of trade unions, right? And that, that wasn't always the case. So I suppose what I would say is I think there's some hope there. If we look at, at demographic changes, there's been a lot of setbacks for organised labour, but actually it's not impossible to, to form unions. And, uh, and, you know, and to some extent, the public sector is actually not a complete failure in that, in that respect. Um, I'm encouraged to see that the union figures for the last couple of years have actually shown a slight rise as well. I'm not claiming that, you know, the corner's been turned and, you know, we'll be back up to 1970s level of power and influence. But that that's good. I suppose the the other thing that's attached to all this is that unions need to, need to be understood by their members to be instruments of power. They need to be understood to be forms of collective action that, that can obtain, like, you know, serious real material improvements in their in their positions. <coughs> and I think where that is demonstrated, unions become much stronger generally. And I think as the I don't need to tell you this because I'd be preaching at the converted, but I think you know, as the that gap between the richest and the poorest continues to increase, there's never been a, a time where unions are more needed. <laughs> and I think you you're seeing more and more stories about exploitative bosses, exploitative organizations and and poorer working conditions for you know, the, the general man and woman. And I think maybe that's why there is a slight increase in union membership, but I think that a lot more needs to be done. And, and I actually think that, you know, over the next 10 to 15 years, that, that number may continue to rise. Well, I hope so. Uh, you know, I think it's... If there was one way that I thought we could make Britain a better, Scotland a better place in the next... 20 years, if I was offered one way to do that, it would be doubling or tripling the number of people that are in trade unions. So that would, in my view, undoubtedly end in, you know, a much more equal society in terms of the distribution of economic rewards, a much more humane society in terms of the expectations placed on people at work. And probably, though, I think also a much more just one in other respects that, you know, if we think about unions as organisations that can take forward arguments for social justice, in a wider sense, that becomes important as well. And I know that, for instance, BLM has had some support from unions in America, which is interesting. Uh, I'm not saying that there's an unproblematic, straightforward relationship there, and unions in the past have certainly advocated in the interest sectionally of, say, a predominantly white male workforce, but I don't think that has to be the case. I don't think it always has been the case. And I think that recent developments in unions, particularly in terms of who's in a union, what we were just talking about, actually indicate that that can be taken in other directions too. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk a bit about the book before we, we wrap up, because I want to make sure that if people have uh, enjoyed listening to you, like I certainly have, uh, they, they know where to purchase it and, and they know a bit about it. So yeah, how would you sum it up? How, how long did it take you to write? What was your process? And most importantly, where will people be able to get it and when? The book took me almost 10 years to write in some ways. So I, I put forward a proposal to write a PhD about deindustrialization in, in the Lanarkshire coal fields at the end of 2011. I started writing that with uh, Professor Duncan Ross and Jim Phillips, who are my supervisors. I got, I was lucky enough to get that funding. And then I, I did some masters, the masters in global economy and the, the research I did for the dissertation for that was about these large new American factories that I mentioned that were brought to Scotland. So that that became kind of part of the background to this. And then I, I went and did research in the archives of government. So that was about energy, it was about industrial policy, it was about the Scottish office, it was about managing unemployment. The archives of the nationalised coal industry, so that was about the closure of collieries for the most part, how that was organised, important records of meetings with with colliery level union officials, so the, the, the voices of workers or miners from the time were heard there, and the records of the National Union of Mine Workers Scottish Area, which reveal how the union as a whole was responding to closures over time, 
and also the union's increasing support for Scottish devolution or home rule, the role of the Communist Party in the union. Um, and I think maybe the most interesting part of this for your listeners might be that I, I then also recorded oral history interviews. So I recorded interviews with miners, with former miners, and with other former industrial workers. I mean, is, from, there anywhere, uh, is there anywhere that people could listen back to them if, if they were interested? Not at the moment, but I am planning on submitting them to an archive. So when I do that, I think that you'll get the full... No, I mean, I think they, they would be interesting and all my participants said, yes, please, Excellent. please, please make these help. Um, so, you know, those oral histories were really important when we think about the title of the book. The meaning... So how deindustrialization was understood at the time was partly a product of those archives. But also, what did they mean to individual workers? What does it mean to live in a family that was being reshaped by, by those experiences? And then obviously the memory. So how how was deindustrialization being understood in Scotland in the 2010s when I did those interviews? How how is this major change in and the economic structure being interpreted by the people that are affected most in the places that were most affected. And I think that also speaks to the theme of coal fields. So coal mining is really important, but it's not just about coal mining. It's about changes in locations that were, that were built around coal mining in the 19th century, but then underwent changing economic structures in the 20th, including that inward investment. And the book goes through two parts, I'd say. The first part is the, an exploration of the experience of the process of deindustrialization. So the first chapter looks at that from above. That's a story about investment in power stations. It's a story about closing coal mines. It's a story about opening new large factories. It's a story about the labor market and, and rates of unemployment, the employment of women, the employment of men in new workplaces. And how that shaped um, union attitudes and politics. But the the second chapter outlines that idea of the moral economy, and that's about how colliery closures were organised in Lanarkshire, very much from a local perspective. So I go through four different case studies in Lanarkshire across time and place, and we start in shots with that story of deindustrialisation beginning in the 1940s, and we go through to the closures in the 1980s that were associated with the abandonment of the moral economy and the build-up to the miners' strike. And that that's a detailed story that's really quite heavily reliant on the voices of miners that are captured from the archives, but also the oral histories of, of men who were there at the time, essentially. Um, after that, the chapters are then about themes, about think about how we understand those changes. So I think about deindustrialization in terms of the remaking of communities. Um, that, that chapter is titled, It Was Pretty Good, because one of my oral history respondents, Brendan Mohan, who, who was a, a miner in Midlovian, who grew up in Musselburgh, just outside of Edinburgh, said, it was pretty good growing up in post-war Scotland in a mining community. And what he meant by that was, there was an organised social life around coal mining. It was it was stable. It was relatively well paid. There was a sense of trajectory, um, and that that forms this idea of critical nostalgia. So I argue that it would be easy to dismiss memories of the post-war period and working class affluence as just nostalgia. But actually, Brendan Myler interviewees aren't are more reflexive than that. They actually are quite critical of the parochial or socially conservative nature of the communities they grew up in, but nevertheless do mourn the loss of what they see as an active, organised social life of trade union influence and power in the workplace, of elements of local democracy, of public housing, of egalitarianism. And then I, I have chapters about gender and generation. So I argue that the industrialisation was fundamentally reconstituted gender relations, firstly, through the, avail the increased availability of new industrial employment for women, but then through the progressive rise of unemployment for men and the way that that disappointed previous expectations. And that, that feeds into generations. So my argument is that there wasn't 
one generation that experienced the industrialization. There was three that there was the the generation of, of miners and their families that had experienced turmoil in the interwar period and saw the nationalized industry as you know this this brilliant new creation that was providing them with economic security. There was a second generation who grew up in that context and demanded more of national the nationalized industry in the 60s and 70s who saw former miners building cars at Linwood or making tractors at Caterpillar earning a lot more than them. And then finally there was a a young generation, the men of Brendan Muhan's age in the of the early who came up into the industry in the early 1980s and then experienced you know dramatic labor market reconstruction. And that that then feeds into our final sort of main chapter on, on Scottish nationhood and the way that the politics of the coalfield, the experience of centralization, the diminishment of the mining industry, encouraged the response that was not just local and not just class-based, but increasingly national. And it explores the NUM Scottish area's increasing demand for a Scottish parliament. And it also includes a study of the Scottish Miners Gala. We're talking about forgotten days of history. I think this is a really interesting annual event that was ran from the 1940s into the mid-1990s. It was a large gathering held by the Scottish Miners Union in Edinburgh every year. And thousands of people would descend on Edinburgh from the coal fields. They'd often march behind uh, their, their colliery banner. Uh, they'd be joined by brass bands and pipe bands. And as well as the sort of miners leaders, trade union leaders from Scotland and from across the UK, you might expect to see there, they were often joined by international guests. I've got a picture of um, delegates from North Vietnam addressing okay. the, the rally at um, Hollywood Park in the late 1960s. This was when That's you know the Vietnam War was on and the North Vietnamese were, were fighting and ultimately winning a war against the Americans. So... I think that's a fascinating bit of political culture and I hope that, I think the book's more optimistic than my thesis was. I think it <laughs> argues that, you know, there is a, that, 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 firstly, that the industrialization wasn't always managed terribly in Scotland and that actually trade unions and socialist or social democratic politics were actually able to achieve a relatively well-ordered transition in industry between the 40s and the 70s, and that changed dramatically and adversely in the 80s and 90s. But also that the collective memory of deindustrialization or the collective memory maybe of industrial society is an important resource that we can look to in contemporary Scotland. And, you know, I think that's important when we face another major transition in, in energy. We're thinking about a just transition towards a, a green and environmentally stable Scotland. So I, I think it's, a, I hope it's an important contribution to understanding working class history and perspectives on the recent past, but also provides some clues as to how we should take things forward. It sounds absolutely brilliant, Ian. And it, I mean, you say it took 10 years. Or are you going to set out another 10 year plan for your, for your next one or <laughs> a bit shorter? Hopefully a bit shorter, but, you know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> and you've got a, a book launch coming out, I believe. You know, this podcast will go out before that. It's The book's due out at the end of February 25th, is that correct? Yeah, so the, the book comes out on the 15th of February, and it's free to read online. Uh, you can buy it in paperback, should you wish. And the event is on the 25th. It's, again, it's a free event. Um, I'll be joined by Brendan Muhan, who I mentioned, one of my oral history participants. Uh, he's also a poet and a, a former miner. Um, I'll also be joined by Arian Mack, who's a historian of, of British miners and um, oral histories. And it's held by the Institute for Historical Research, who were involved in, in publishing my book. Um, there's a link for it available. Maybe I can just send you it and you could maybe tweet Absolutely. it out or something. But. Yeah, not a problem. What's your thoughts behind it being being free to read online? Because I, I can't imagine many uh, authors would be keen to do that in, in the first instance. But for me, I, I'm quite old school. I prefer to pick up a physical copy of the book. So certainly I, I would do that. But that's a really interesting take. Well, I think that, you know, I didn't write this book with the aim of making money out of it. I, academics don't don't really make money out of writing books. And I think that 
we're increasingly encouraged to think about audiences and engagement, and I think there's a lot of value to that. I wanted this book to be available to the people that it's written about, directly the people who feature in it, but indirectly, you know, the people who live in the former coal fields who, like yourselves, are, are interested in this. So I hope that this is a mechanism that will increase the readership and, and make the book available to, to that wider audience. I think from my uh, initial moanings about, you know, that there's not enough resources out there to, to people that want to learn, that is certainly a, a welcome addition. So so thank you, Ewan. And more importantly, thanks so much for your time. I, I really enjoyed chatting to you and I'm sure those that have listened or, or watched this will have enjoyed it as well. Uh, for those that maybe want to catch up with you afterwards, is there anywhere they can they can find you? On Twitter, probably the best bet, uh, at Ewan Gibbs, E-W-A-N-G-I-B-B-S. Um, I usually respond to DMs if they're not too abusive. So. <laughs> now and again then, now and again. <laughs> Ewan, as I said, thanks so much for your time. Uh, thanks to everyone that has uh, listened or watched this podcast. If you've not done so, please go back and check some older episodes and like and subscribe. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot.